Welcome to our weekday text gathering. Today is day 115 in the Circles reading schedule, and we are discussing chapter 7, section 10, the state of grace. In This is the last section of chapter 7, and in the complete and annotated edition of A Course in Miracles, you can find this on page 293. As we were discussing before I hit record, this section has some very beautiful things to say about our natural state, which can seem very lofty and metaphysical, but I have found it deeply practical today in the process of standing before a very worldly question. We have so many of these worldly questions and only one answer. As Robert and I are practicing today, nothing real can be threatened and nothing unreal exists. As for the announcements for today, we have a Course Companion Sunday gathering coming up this Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and the topic is I Rest in God. These gatherings are usually only open to Course Companions, but this topic is so relevant, and we have Netta Boyne coming to sing her beautiful song, I Rest in God. And Sunday is her birthday, so we just thought this is too good. We have to open this up to everyone. So an email will be going out to the Circle's mailing list with a link to access the Sunday gathering. Um, the link is going out this afternoon. So if you are not on our mailing list, please go to circleofa.org forward slash subscribe and look for the details on how to join the Sunday gathering in your inbox soon. All right, so I invite you to close your eyes and take a deep collective breath as we join together in bowing our heads in prayer. Dear God, we are grateful for the opportunity to come together as loving friends and mighty companions on this remarkable path of light. We surrender this gathering to you and ask that it serve your purposes and be blessed by you. Remove in us any blocks to the awareness of your presence and may we learn to think like you so that we may be led to the highest vision of ourselves and one another. We use this time to plant within us the seeds of grace that we may emerge from this experience more peaceful, humble, and loving beings. Please take a moment to extend your prayers to all who are affected by the pandemic and the world. Those who are sick, those who are afraid of being sick, those who have friends and loved ones who are ill. Our continued prayers go out to Miguel and his family. And we also extend our prayers to Kimmy and to Hannah. Hannah, who is getting married this weekend. Please take a moment to extend your blessing to everyone on this call. Say silently to each person in your mind, spirit is in the state of grace forever. Your reality is only your spirit. Therefore, you are in the state of grace forever. Now take a moment to receive the love and blessing from all of those who are blessing and loving you right now. Spirit is in the state of grace forever. My reality is only my spirit. Therefore, I am in the state of grace forever. And so it is. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, as mentioned, our section is the state of grace. Let me go ahead and share my screen. You know, I've been uh, numbering uh, the, the notes. So this is our 22nd gathering. And since we only do five a week, that means we've been at it just about a month at this point, right? That's something. 
Okay. Um, Emily, you might want to make sure everyone's muted. I'm, I'm yeah. hearing leakage. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so it's a lovely title, The State of Grace, and in this section, it refers to heaven. Before I launch into what is said, I think a, a great way to lay some context for it is in talking about how we think of heaven in the course relative to the world. Because I think course students generally, at least, I mean, not generally, but at least in large numbers, a large percentage of us tend to think heaven sounds kind of boring kind of empty. Like we know it has no form. We know it has no change. Well, isn't form and change and changing forms, forms in motion, isn't that what we enjoy about life? So it seems like, like heaven's this place that is empty of everything we enjoy. So it seems very alien and possibly quite boring. Uh, and then we think of the world as, well, the world is full of excitement and enjoyment. There are those changing, moving forms that we can derive pleasure from. And earth feels familiar. It feels relatable. We talk about mother earth. If you think of the word home, this seems like home, right? This is what we know. This is where we fit. This is, this is what seems natural to us. So I think this section addresses all that in a great way. Without directly addressing it, I mean, there were no, I mean, I don't know what Helen and Bill thought about heaven, but there weren't masses of course students, you know, back then worried about was heaven boring. Uh, but still, I think it provides us with a more helpful way to think about heaven because thinking about it as just the absence of certain things, well, that, there's accuracy in that. But this section gives us a way to think about it in terms of what is present there rather than just what's absent. So let's go ahead and, and dive in and I'll kind of circle back to these thoughts uh, after I go through my, my notes here. Okay, so heaven is a state of grace. What does that word grace mean? I was looking it up today in the dictionary. And I think, I mean, there are like a dozen meanings for it in some dictionaries. But I think there are several that are relevant. And the ones that I thought were relevant I have here. Grace means moving in a smooth and relaxed way. If someone moves with grace, right? That's what that means. It means behaving in a pleasant and polite way. If someone behaves with grace, that's what that means. It refers to the granting of a favor. And it refers to a free gift from God. And that's, of course, the familiar definition from Christianity. God's grace is him granting a favor, is him just giving freely. And I don't really know what definitions of grace Jesus is playing on here. He doesn't elaborate on the word that much, or, or perhaps not at all. But I feel like these four are, are all relevant. I feel like there is, there is a grace to the environment he's talking about in the sense of the first two definitions. And there's definitely grace in the sense of the third and fourth definitions of, of just uh, something granted freely. So just try to keep those in mind. And if you could, let me just say this, if you could take all four of those definitions and kind of mush them together and then think about an environment that was a state of grace. I think that gets us in the ballpark of what he means here. A lot of the section shows a contrast between heaven, which is the state of grace, and the world. 
And through looking at these contrasts, some of the contrasts are explicit, some are implicit. One side of the contrast is listed and the other side is just implied. But through these contrasts, I think we get a, a sense of how he wants us to think about heaven and how we actually experience this world. Okay, so first of all, he says that heaven is your natural environment. It's what's actually natural to you. And he says and, and implies that the world is not natural. He says the world goes against your nature. So heaven is something that totally fits our nature. And the world doesn't. It goes against it. Even though we think of the word natural as referring to physical nature, right? Trees, mountains, streams. Uh, in the course, again and again, he uses the word natural in a way where basically this world is not natural. Heaven is the environment you were created for. So it's the environment that you were made for and that was made for you. Um, in fact, I think it's better to say the environment that was created for you. Where you belong, where you fit your environment and it fits you. In contrast, the world is the environment you made, which fundamentally does not fit you. He says, you therefore cannot adapt to it, nor can you adapt it to, and I should put that word, change, I'm just changing the language to apply to us here, to yourself. Okay. And this is a huge issue, and I'm gonna to return to this at the end. We're constantly trying to adapt ourselves to fit the world. That's, that's growing up, right? Growing up is you learn to adapt and adjust so that you, you kind of fit and you're equal to the world. And we're trying to adapt it to fit us. That's why we aren't just all living, you know, outdoors, roaming the hills, you know, our whole lives. We, we create homes for ourselves that, that fit us. They're adapted to us. Okay, so we're constantly trying to do both. And what he's saying is, it never works. We never fully adapt ourselves to this environment, the world, and we never fully adapt it to us so that it fits us. And that, that struggle and strain defines our lives. Okay, heaven, he says, is the only environment in which you will not experience strain. And I think part of the, the meaning of state of grace involves this lack of strain. Whereas in the world, everything's a strain. Everything is difficult to one degree or another. Have you ever noticed that? Everything is at least a little bit difficult. I don't like difficulty. I'm sort of by nature pretty lazy. And I'm just noting all the time, like, I gotta wash that cup. I'd rather not wash the cup, right? I've got to make that food. I've got to clean that floor. Well, I at least sweep it. I don't really clean floors. Um, and each time it's like, oh, I really don't. In the mornings, I, I light a little candle during my quiet time. And I've got a, a little oil uh, burner thing where you put water and oil above the candle. And it, and it kind of disappears you know, disperses through the room. I'm like, do I really want to get the candle out, light the candle and put water in the thing and pour the oil in? It's like, I don't want to do that. I do just because I like the, the smell and the light. Um, but every little thing is like that. It's all a strain. And it's because I think that lack of fit where we can't adapt us to it or it to us. Okay, heaven is the only environment that is worthy of a son of God. And in relation to the world, this section asks us, is it worthy to be a home for a child of God? 
Heaven, he says, by implication, protects your peace, protects your peace and shines love upon you. And that's implied in this line where he asks about the world, does it protect your peace? I mean, does it? The world seems pretty intent on constantly chipping away at our peace, right? Does it shine love upon you? I, I uh, oftentimes will watch a movie or something where, where you're just dying for someone to show kindness to the, the main character. Have you ever watched a movie like that? Where it's like, please let this next person he or she meets show them some kindness rather than just try to use them or step on them or, you know, walk past them, ignore them. You know, the world does not just shine love upon us. Far from it. Okay, heaven keeps you utterly free from fear. And that's implied when he asks, does the world keep your heart untouched by fear? Does the world keep your heart untouched by fear? Wouldn't it be great to be in an environment that purposefully, constantly keeps your heart in touch, untouched by fear? Heaven allows you to give always without any sense of loss. Now, if you just stopped at the give always part, you'd think, oh my gosh, that, how draining. We do want to give. There's a strong impulse to give in us but we also associate it with loss. So we kind of balance it out. We give and we rest and we give and we do things that are just for us and so on. But imagine you could always satisfy the impulse to give and never have any sense of loss. He says, heaven teaches you, or he implies, that giving is your joy and that God himself thanks you for it. And all it's implied when he asks us, when he asks us about the world, does the world allow you to give always without any sense of loss? Well, no, it doesn't. Does it teach you that this giving is your joy? No, it doesn't. And that God himself thanks you for your giving. In heaven, God watches over you and denies you nothing. And there's that sense of, of grace in which grace is free gift, right? God just is like the perfect father, giving you everything. He says in this section, by denying yourself heaven, you deny yourself everything. Finally, in heaven, as a son of God, you are happy because you, are, because you know you are with God. He says in this um, section, a son of God is happy only if he knows he is with God. And that makes sense. If, if you're a son of God, do you want to be apart from your father, from your creator, from your source, from your home? In the world, you feel without God and thus are unhappy. Looking over all of those contrasts, I think we come up with a general idea that captures almost all of them, not quite all, but almost all. The basic idea is this is our natural environment and therefore it's perfectly suited to our nature. It perfectly suits us, protects our peace, shines love on us, keeps our heart untouched by fear, and then we perfectly suit it in that we continually give to it without let up because we realize that that giving is not our loss, it's our gain. So what that means is it's an environment in which there is perfect harmony between us and our environment. And that's why there's no strain or difficulty, right? There's strain and difficulty when you're at odds with your environment, you're trying to you know, get yourself to fit it. You're trying to change it around to fit you, right? I have to light that candle and put the water in and put the oil in and all that to get my environment to be what I want, to fit me, right? So I have to put out effort to do that. It takes effort to wash the dishes and to put the clean ones away and all those things. We're in a situation in this world, we may think it's home, 
We may think it's our mother, but we're in a situation in which there is constant disharmony between us and our environment. We wish we, we were better towards it. We wish we, we were a better fit with it. We wish it was a better fit with us. And so I think that there is a profound longing in us for that perfect environment where there is perfect harmony between us and our environment. Imagine perfect harmony between you and your environment. So you absolutely belong. You absolutely fit. You're not out of place. It absolutely fits you perfectly. So it feels like home. Think about the word paradise. That word paradise really evokes something in me. I want paradise. Don't we all want paradise? Think of what the word means. Isn't paradise exactly what I'm talking about here in these very abstract terms? It's an environment that perfectly suits you. You perfectly suit it. There's just absolute harmony between you and it. It showers you with everything, right? You aren't some kind of curse on it. You know, you're beneficial for it. We long for paradise, which means we long for this perfect harmony between us and our environment. And that's how we should think of heaven. Don't think, okay, heaven is the absence of everything I enjoy. There's no change, there's no form. Think heaven is this natural environment. I was made for it, it was made for me. There's a perfect fit and therefore nothing's a strain. There's absolute harmony. It's therefore, it's paradise. So I don't think we have to worry about all the, well, how can we have enjoyment when there's no form? And how can we have enjoyment when there's no change? Just think about this idea of being in an environment that fits this description. That would be paradise. Okay. So I have an exercise, but as usual, why don't we pause for a bit? And you and I have talked about this, Emily, this whole idea about people are concerned that heaven is boring and Right. So I'm sure yeah. you have a few things to say. I do. I do. Because we do tend to think of heaven as the, to the extent that we think of heaven, we think of it as the nothingness, the void, the emptiness, and it isn't all that appealing. And worst case, it brings up the annihilation fears because we're so identified with being ourselves. Where do we go in heaven? And I remember saying to you at one point, if I just keep a piece of my ego, can I stay here in my body? <laughs> and we were laughing at that because like, well, that's not really, really the point. But I, I love this idea of thinking of heaven, not as the absence of, but the presence of, because that's what makes us long for it. Because right. herein lies the heart of so much of our spiritual struggle. You know, we want to long for God. We have that pull. And yet in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't actually put him first. We put our personal pleasures first. But if we think about what our personal pleasures are, they're always centering around love, giving love and being loved. And if we knew that in heaven, we are in a state of unconditional love, then we would long for it more. So I think heaven has a, a PR problem. We just don't know what it is. And this is where NDEs come in so much uh, because one of the ones that you and I return to all the time, Robert, is, is this, um, I forget it was a guy or a girl, but he said, think of the way in which you have loved here on earth, the deepest love, the deepest earthly love that you have ever known. And that is a match in front of the sun compared to what it is to be loved by God. And I just remember, I mean, I've always been really affected by that. So um, I think we just have to see heaven differently to release that strain that we have around it and allow that pull of God that's inherent in us to come through. Yeah, and I think we've got to think of it almost like, if you can imagine, I mean, some of those NDE 
and environments where all the flowers and blades of grass are loving the person. That's not heaven from the course's standpoint, but it's a start because there's this harmony between you and your environment. And the course is heaven, we could imagine as being just turning the dial up so that everything just gets so absolutely unlimited, so boundless and intense that there's no room, you know, forms would limit it. Change would limit it. So it's not less of that kind of thing, it's immeasurably more. Lori is saying, I can relate to that. I don't want to do it. I struggle with commitment to anything, but anything, including my course practice. But when I do anything, especially if I'm happy when I do it, I know it will make me happy, joyous, and free. How do I get over the forcing myself to do anything? I think we all need that course trainer that you talked about yesterday <laughs> that would come every, every hour and tell yeah. you to do your practice and get on your lessons. I think what we want to do is say, this is the right thing. And I just got to force myself to do it. And what we should do is reason with ourselves and say, this is actually my happiness. And I'll be better off if I do it. It's easier to say, I, I'll force myself, but that's not as effective. And it's not right. Yeah, because then your practice becomes like going to the gym, something that you know you should do, but you don't really want to. And that's why conversations like these are so important, because if you can get into that place of, I want this, I want this more than anything, then you wouldn't find so much resistance to the practice itself. Yeah, sometimes I think that's the challenge, at least it is for me to admit that I actually do want this. It's easier to like keep that out of your mind and say, okay, okay I'll force myself. But there's something more challenging about admitting I really want this. Margaret anyway. says, are we created to create heaven in this world? Does practice take us towards that? Practice takes us towards making a reflection of heaven on earth. Um, and then we get, when we do that perfectly, we get back to heaven and creation in the course only takes place in heaven. So yes, we were created to create in heaven in which we add to the kingdom, the Course says, and we increase the kingdom, we extend God's being. Um, and we get there by doing kind of a practice run here on earth. Andrew, you always ask the, the deepest, most intense metaphysical questions are here. Andrew says, why did we leave? <laughs> well, the Course basically says we had two reasons. One was we wanted to be above God. We wanted to be the creator, not the created. And the other was we wanted to be above all our brothers. We wanted to be God's favorite. And I think all of those are just, it's, you know, there's this impulse that, that was the birth of the ego to be above. And I think we just thought maybe it'll be even better, you know? And obviously it wasn't, but I guess we didn't know that. And that's what landed us here in these bodies. Yeah. Sue says, I had a brief experience of what I would describe as heaven on earth. There was no sense of loss of identity. I experienced an enlarged awareness of truth as God, as God made it, love, peace, joining, joy, happiness, sense of this is where I want to stay. I wanted it to last forever. This sounds like what the Course would call revelation. Is that right, Robert? Well, um, it's been a while actually since, since, I, since you shared your experience with me, Sue. So I don't remember all the details. My memory wants to say that it was not quite at the revelation level, but more on the real world vision level. Um, but abs absolutely my memory was it totally reflected what the Course is teaching. Um, and yeah, we do retain identity. It's just an identity that's not actually separate. It's, it's, it's one with everything. And when people like you have an experience like that, the same things get reported again and again. It's like this was so much better than anything I normally experienced that I can't put it in words or, you know, I can't compare the two. It's always so cool when someone has an experience that echoes how the course describes it. Um, so to put those two things together, it makes you realize like, oh, wow. 
Yeah. That yeah. So anyway, always. Sue, I, I, I just don't remember well to answer the question um, specifically. So we can always communicate more about it. Robert. Yeah. This I'm speaking about a different experience that I didn't write to you about. Oh, okay. Okay. It was after my mother's funeral. Okay. Okay. Well, if you ever do feel inspired to, I would love to. Yeah. Read it. I posted and, it. And we are going okay. to start posting course based experiences on the website we're working on right yeah. now. That's a project we hope to roll out in the next couple of months. So we'd love to, to you to share your story with us, Sue. Yeah. I just actually wrote Sue about that. Oh, you did. Okay. So last question, and then we'll move on to the exercise, and then we'll close for today. Terry says, would you say that the so-called happy dream is a way we try and manifest heaven on earth? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the course, happy dream is a bit of a, uh, uh, the term doesn't sound like the way the course uses it, and the course hardly ever uses it. The course uses it more to talk about a state of mind than the dream outside of us. Um, but yeah, the course wants us, it, when it talks about saving the world, it's always a positive. It thinks we all are here to work towards that one goal of saving the world, which means bringing the world into a state where it's as close to this kind of environment as the world can get. And wouldn't that be amazing? I would. Okay. We can move on. Okay. So I just wanna take you through essentially what the section itself takes you through, just with a bit added to the end. And you might've been doing some facsimile of this in your mind already. So here are these words from the course. Consider the kingdom which you have made, meaning this world, and judge its worth fairly. So now ask yourself the following questions and try to ask them as sincerely and seriously as you can. And I'll go ahead and read them to you and give you a moment to ask each one in your own mind. And this is about this world. Is it worthy to be a home for a child of God? Does it protect my peace and shine love upon me. Does it keep my heart untouched by fear? And allow me to give always without any sense of loss. Does it teach me that this giving is my joy and that God himself thanks me for my giving? And now say to yourself, that is the only environment in which I can be happy. A son of God is happy only if he knows he is with God. That is my natural environment. That is the environment that was created for me. Okay, amen. You look at that exercise and you read paragraph three in this section, you realize what aliens we are here on earth, don't you? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's weird to ask those questions felt very different than to talk about them. How so? Uh, it just was a lot more impactful to actually ask the question. It just brought like new things to mind. Anyway. Yeah. We'll, we'll close. What what it brought to to my mind, and, and I promise we're going to show. <laughs> if y'all need to drop <laughs> off, please do. But we're all home. But what it, what it brought up for me was the the idea of we are in a state of grace forever, and yet the course also says that grace is a total commitment. So we can't change this about ourselves, and yet we need to be vigilant about keeping ourselves in um, the state where our minds are protected against all that the ego would want to bring in. Yeah. Yeah. So a reminder, once again, everyone, please join us on Sunday for our Course Companion Sunday gathering. We are, again, opening that to all. So we hope to see you there. If you want to go to, if you're on our mailing list, you will be getting a link for that. If you are not on our mailing list, go to circleofa.org forward slash subscribe. And we hope to see you there on Sunday. And if not, we hope to see you back for our weekday text gatherings on Monday morning where we will start chapter eight. Look forward to seeing you all then. Bye for now. Thank you, Robert. And thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.